I don't think that'll make a lot of difference. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, it's lovely to have you back. It's time for episode of 11. It uh, is. A, drunk, a book, and uh, and it's great to have uh, this amazing setup this week, Jason. We're doing it via Skype, and uh, we've got a little Duda. what do you want to call it, a little application that actually I puts the two pictures together automatically. It's amazing. Amazing, yeah. So it's like uh, that in underpants who does those songs on chat roulette. Yes, yeah, Steve. I can't remember his last name, but uh, that Wrecking Ball video is pretty damn funny. Did you? Oh, I see the, the first one was funny. The second one was, I felt like I've seen this before and I have to listen to Wrecking Ball. I quite like the song. I know we, we've talked about this before, but uh, yeah. I, yeah, put Miley Cyrus to one side. I actually think it's a pretty good song. It probably is. I mean, I'm, I'm much the same with um, Lady Gaga's Paparazzi. She does a, a brilliant piano version of that song and it just takes it somewhere else and it mm. sounds fantastic. Uh, and that's right. Miley Cyrus is just, you know, she's the Coke label on the bottle. So, you know, she's not the actual drink. Now, that's our introduction because we've got lots of very interesting things to talk about this time around. Can I yeah. go first? Oh, I wanted to go first. You I go first. Go. You go first. Right. I don't care. Well, well, it kind of ties into our intro because I was wanted to talk about great live acts, mm. and and the reason I'm going to bring it up is uh, is um, I had was fortunate enough uh, over the weekend to see two in one weekend, which has oh you went and saw eight. Justin Bieber, did you? I did see Bieber, and the Spice Girls were here on Sunday. Uh, Jack Johnson uh, was playing at Kings Park on Saturday. Went and saw him, and I went and saw uh, Nile Rogers and Sheik on Sunday at the Astor. And uh, two completely different shows. Jack Johnson was kind of a laid back. He had some Hawaiian musicians in there. It was a very cruisy gig um, in Kings Park as well on, on the lawn there. Beautiful night. Um, whereas Nile Rogers uh, was indoor at the Astor. Completely different sort of vibe, but i tell you what the big difference was between those two is Noel Rogers just knew how to get an audience and keep them on their feet, which was, you know, what he was about. I was going to say, he's been doing that for 30 years. Just, just, and more, uh, just absolutely nails it. And it was amazing to watch him just work that crowd. And I'm, I'm not much of a dancer, but uh, watching that show, there was a huge amount of booty shaking going on. That's something uh, I never so, want to see. Yeah. Well, what is it? Oh, lots of the older ladies do that very much. <laughs> um, you know, so what is it that makes a great live performer when you think about those great shows? And not saying Jack Johnson was good, mm. but he wasn't great. Um, whereas, you know, Noel Rogers was great. And I've seen people like Joe Cocker. He was great. Uh, Pearl Jam were great. And I've seen other bands that were good, but, you know, like Crowded House, they're good, but they're not, you know. Yeah, I think, I mean, look, there's multiple elements, obviously, and I'm not a famous musician, so I'm not really one to speak. But from what I can tell, uh, good source material is, I think you've got to start from there. And then it's engagement. It's actually engaging with the crowd. And it doesn't have to necessarily be individual engagement, but it's just acknowledging the crowd and making them a part of the show. Well, and there's, look, there's different ways of doing that, too. You'll see a, a local band, and I'll, and I'll catch a few local bands around town. And one of the things they do is they kind of stop between songs and they have a bit of a chat about something and they play the next song. And to be honest, it really annoys me because I'm like, you know, just pump through those songs. And the reason they do it, they've got a 50-minute set and they've got, you know, 40 minutes of song, so they're just trying to drag it out a little bit. But, you know, one of the things that great performers do is if, if there's a particular interesting story for a particular song, they'll do that. But otherwise, they'll just, you know, bang into each song and, and, and knock it through, and uh, which is exactly what Niall did, and it was amazing. He, he'd stop for a bit of a story before something, or he'd say, you know, when he wrote that song or who he wrote it for, uh, but then was, you know, straight into yeah. it, getting out reaction, clapping, cat calling, all that See, sort of I've, stuff. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of concerts in my time, not so much recently, but certainly a lot in my 20s. And, you know, everything from Transition Vamp and uh, lots and lots of bands. But I've got to tell you, and you're probably going to laugh when you hear it, but the best concert I ever saw by a long shot, and I'm talking head and shoulders above everything else, was Johnny Farnham. 
It was just the most amazing experience of my life. And I, it still raises the hairs on the back of my neck. He's just, he is a legend. Oh, look, uh, an amazing voice. And I haven't seen him live, but I'm sure that he would be a, a brilliant live performer. I have no doubt about that. But once again, he, he is one of those performers who takes it to the next level. You know, there are some performers that are just world class. Yeah, but and, he's never and, broken yeah. it worldwide, has he? And that amazes me. You see Kylie Minogue going worldwide, but Johnny Farnham never quite made it. Obviously, you know, whatever it is about him, it just hasn't, it hasn't touched uh, people around the world uh, the way it does, you know, which you know, kind of makes him a bit more quintessentially Australian. Uh, and there's, you know, lots of great performers uh, in Australia who haven't, you know, made it overseas. I mean, there's a litany, is that the right word, of bands in the 80s, Aussie pub rock bands that were... The, a the menagerie, best. should we go with that? Uh, we could use that. A, a plethora. plethora. <laughs> uh, and and uh, and there's so many of them that, that, you know, never made it that big or only you know, had minor success, if any. Uh, but they were fantastic bands. It and just blows me away, though. We've got all these fantastic bands, and the one that cracks it for us worldwide is Gotia. <laughs> Good yeah, song, you, but it's, you know. You had something original and different. Uh, you can look back to Savage Garden. Uh, you know, they, they were huge internationally. You know, they didn't particularly have anything different, but whatever they had was the right ingredient at the right time. And that's what, you know, that's what Whispering Jack had as an album. Mm -hmm. For us in Australia, he just captured a moment. Uh, but for the rest of the world, they weren't they weren't in the same place. You know, they were they were more what was 1986, 87. So it was you know more uh, kind of uh, rap and hip hop and and rock was kind of blending at that stage overseas. So we we're getting you know the Run DMCs and you know the Arrhythmics and and John Farnham maybe was seen as a little bit old school. Anyway, it was funny. I mean great Looking at all of that, you know, we talk about these formularized performers as well, and it's just it just seems odd to me that another one of the acts that has actually got quite a bit of airtime in the US over the last few years is Jessica Mowboy. Now, I'm not saying she's not talented. She's clearly very talented, but I wonder why she is getting so many gigs. You know, you have these songs where you go, it's Jay-Z yeah. featuring Jessica Mowboy. Yeah. Uh, is it her talent or is it the fact she actually looks American? Uh, yeah, two things. I, I think, you know, perhaps the difference between her and Delta Goodrum to a degree is skin tone. Mm. Uh, so that kind of gives her a, a chance to maybe uh, for the marketing people to work her in slightly different mm. sectors of the market, tie her in more with those kind of R&B performers uh, more than they could with Delta Goodrum. Uh, which I, I guess is something that's working better for Jessica than, than you know, for, I'm using Delta as an example because she was another young, talented female performer um, who went over to the US and tried to crack it but, you mm. know, essentially didn't. Uh, Jessica has, has had a better run and I think that's because there's a, a better market for her than there is Delta. I think Delta is a bit flooded and, you know, mm. Whatever reason, you know, it also comes down to how much your record company is prepared yeah. to spend. Yeah, that's true. We've got to move on, Paul. It's um, eight minutes, I think, we've spent on this particular yeah. subject. So let's five. let's so move on. Three. Something that's been all over the media today and something that's been driving me up the bloody wall as well is the culling of sharks. Now, yes. it's got me flabbergasted. I can't understand where the logic comes from to cull sharks they're talking about putting baits out near the edge of swimming zones to actually try and attract the sharks so they can kill them now, that's got to be the stupidest idea i have ever heard i can't find a single person who is in support of culling sharks i don't know where this is coming from what's the government trying to prove do you know where it's coming from and it's and i'm sure i'm sure i can assure you it's all behind closed doors I would say that it's coming from particular areas of Chamber of Commerce who run particular businesses who make a particular amount of money off people who frequent the beach. And what they don't want to see is numbers dropping uh, because they're going to lose income, whether they run a lovely hotel there on Coslo Beach or a pub or some accommodation. Uh, what they really want is, uh, is people to come, people to come they can go to the beach uh, as opposed to go to the pool or stay at home. Uh, and I would say that uh, some of those people 
um, who happen to be in a lecturers, maybe, I don't know, of people who are high up in the state government uh, saying, you know, mate, you really need to do something. My business might suffer from this. And, you know, I've got X amount of money for your next election campaign should you need it if you can help me out. And, uh, and get this problem out of our way. It's a difficult situation because you've got certain locations, certain beaches, where it's virtually impossible to put a shark net up. So you can't actually make the beach safe. So all this talk about putting up baits and, and culling the sharks, my concern is that the shark, as we all know, is an apex predator, and it disrupts the entire food chain if you disrupt the sharks. And that, that really worries me because the sharks aren't the only creatures in the ocean that can be dangerous. Well, you know what? If we, if we lived in Africa and, uh, or oh, let's say, as an example, we had lions in Australia. And if you went out bushwalking, uh, let's say you went down the Bibbulmun track, uh, there was a chance because there's lions out there that you might get eaten by a lion walking along that track. Now, the question has to be asked, you know, what do you do? Well, you need to take precautions uh, whilst you're walking along that track so that you don't get eaten by a lion or as, as best as possible. Put that off. I mean, if you just went out and started killing all the lions that came near the track, there would be a huge amount of outrage. The, the difference is, is we can do it. It's a coal by any other name. I don't know what kind of um, euphemism the, the government uh, using for it in the moment but because it's happening in the water and because it's happening with boats out to sea people won't see it so well, and you know, because they, sharks aren't cuddly well even i mean people are, i think are generally concerned but i think if they don't see it then they're not too concerned yeah i don't know i just i, I get very frustrated at the whole situation especially when i can't find anybody who can defend it it just makes me wonder and i mean you've given a pretty good a pretty plausible explanation as to why they're doing it but it's not it's not something a government should push ahead with if the vast majority of the population are a hundred percent against it yeah i i just don't i think people won't see it i think they think it'll blow over uh, within a period of time, uh, as long as they can try and to some degree make sure there aren't too many photos of them pulling sharks out of the water. Look, and if there is, every now and again, look, it's probably going to go, look, we pulled this shark out. It was 10 metres from the beach. Uh, and so, you know, it's only the one shark we've caught. Um, and so they'll paint it as a good thing. So I, I don't think they can lose. I think they're pretty, although I don't agree with it, uh, I, I think they see this as a win-win situation for for businesses who who rely on the trade and and people going to the beach, uh, and for the population who'll go, hey, there's less sharks and maybe even more people will be attracted to Chain the beach. Chainmail bathing suits. There's the next big thing. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I mean, there used to be. Uh, there is in Geelong. I don't know whether you've ever been there, but there's a, a cage, uh, pretty much. It's essentially a cage. Uh, that they have at the beach. And uh, and that's terrific. You know, if you're really worried about sharks, just go and swim in the cage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's no jellyfish, there's no sharks, there's, you know, They could just quite spiggle. easily put up a, a cage or a, a giant shark net in Gracetown where we've had some attacks of late because the shape of the bay in Gracetown means that you could quite easily string something across there. But, of course, the big you know, issue I'm that you, you... Can I hear you talking? I'm not sure. Breaking up a little bit. Why couldn't they uh, string them between groins like a collar's like? Yeah, why no, they, they just... absolutely could. Yeah, and why not? I mean, yeah, there you go. We finally got a use for that collar's pole again. It is still there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's still there. You know, kids love jumping off it. I mean, you know, I suppose I don't know whether there are any sport uh, fishermen out there or whether that would get in their way or that's something. But uh, and look, you can't guarantee with a shark net either. That's probably another problem. Yeah, what if the um, shark I, gets I over it, gets stuck inside it? <laughs> well, and other animals do too. That's the thing, you know, dolphins, turtles, all sorts of stuff. Um, I don't think it's a problem uh, you're going to get rid of. Uh, whether they they get rid of them here, a, a few years ago there was a man taken at Rottnest Island. Uh, they'll be taken north, they're taken south. It's just a thing, you know, and, and especially people who are surfing should understand yeah, that. I mean, that's right. You love yep. surfing, but at the same time, you know, surely you're more than aware that, you know, you're surfing where sharks live. Well, That's in, in closing, <laughs> in closing, the day that sharks get legs and start coming up on the beach, that's when I'll agree with culling. 
Yeah, you know, once once they once they get jetpacks and stuff, then you know, I guess we'll have to you know set up a war. But but in the meantime, uh, yeah, you know, uh, maybe it's a little different for me. I tend not to paddle in the sea that often, uh, and if I went every day, uh, maybe I might want the government to do something. I don't think they'll lose. I think they will get popular support because it will be seen as not many sharks, um, and so people think, well, it makes the beaches a bit safer. Um, but, uh, yeah, essentially I don't agree with it. It's not a good idea to kill anything like that, yep. you know, yep. surely we're above that. Um, another thing, uh, talking of uh, stuff related to government, uh, does it matter if we make cars here or have an airline, do you think? Not at all. I, I, worry, about, whether... I worry about the, the, the losing all of that em employment. So you've got a whole bunch of unemployed people who have got particular skill sets who are going to find it very difficult to find new employment. So I really worry about that. But in terms of whether or not it's made here, I don't think it makes a iota of difference. Do you think there is some value in having the manufacturing infrastructure here uh, for something if uh, like a war breaks out uh, and we need to suddenly start making... Uh, stuff for the war effort and suddenly we look around and there are no factories to do this? Geez, that's a tough one because I, I, I can't see that we're going to be having any kind of war in the, in the near future. It's just... No, not, nobody can, really. The, the world is a little bit different to how it was, you know, back in the, the early part of that. Yeah, just, you know, there's some interesting islands just to the south of Japan and to the north of Korea that, mm. uh, you know, mm. uh, it could... Uh, just I and mean, there are there are plenty of flashpoints in the world, but just to use an example of something that could yeah. very quickly. I guess I've never uh, thought about it in terms of manufacturing. Um, yeah, from that perspective, maybe it would be okay to have a nationalised manufacturing infrastructure for certain things, perhaps. Uh, so, so, therefore, do we need like a, a British Leyland of uh, yeah. of Australian car manufacturing? The government should own. A car company and make cars. I would. So I, they hold well, me personally, I would much rather that than having a hugely subsidised organisation like Holden or Ford or even Toyota. Um, you know, you've got a private organisation there that's benefiting from, uh, you know, investment from the government. So the government might as well do it themselves anyway. And uh, you know, there's um, a lot to be said for having a nationalised industry like that. I just I, I'm of the belief that private enterprise is all about chasing the dollar, whereas a nationalised industry can be more about the quality of the product. Yeah, well, the trouble is, um, and are my dogs going nuts? Can you hear them barking? Yep. Yeah. Just let me go and get my dog. But hold that thought. <laughs> uh, in the absence of Paul Cook, while well, he's not actually here, maybe we can sing a song together. Or not? I don't know. What can we see in the background? Can you see anything there? Anything interesting? See, see me. No, oh, there was just. Uh, uh, I was having a conversation with our with our viewer. You can see there's the piano and the bookshelf, and there's the Christmas tree over there, but you can't really see them. Um, uh, Ted loves the dog over the back. They they're just saying hello to each other. Um, I I believe that. One of the misnomers we seem to have is that somehow if something's nationalised, it is completely uh, fat and ineffective and uh, completely incapable uh, of being competitive in any way, shape or form, uh, unlike a private business. And I, I wonder whether that particular ideology is is put forth by those that believe in the free market is the greatest gift to humanity. Yeah. I I've always tended to think mm -hmm. that the government should be able to uh, run a business as well as the private sector, uh, but instead, like a not-for-profit organisation, instead yep. of yep. Uh, that money being profit that you know goes to the suits, that money is invested either back into the company exactly. or back into the government or back into research and development. So, you know, I, I do think it's important, though, that we do have a manufacturing base, but I I don't like seeing as much as anyone else, and, and we saw the same thing happen in America. Um, you know, millions of dollars, billions of dollars are funneled into the car companies, and these CEOs are paid, you know, billions of dollars of wages to. And that's what's happening. That's the reason why they're not profitable, is because they're giving far too much money to their executives, 
and you know, and you talk about having fat in an organization. Well, I dare you to go and take a look at Ford or Toyota or or Holden, and I guarantee that you'll find massive inefficiencies. Well, it goes to uh, we have a look at a similar thing with Qantas. They've got to get rid of a thousand people, and they've said, you know, this is what we've got to do because, you know, we need to restructure the company in such a way because you know we have to be X amount percentage Australian owned and blah blah blah. And there was a great article that came out late last week and raises some fair points and and uh, a lot of it I tend to agree with. I tend to think that surely if the CEO and the board were any good, they should have seen these problems coming. Why do they Why do they have to have drastic measures now? Why do they have to go cap in hand to the government, get rid of a 1,000 people and say, we need money or we have to run? Yeah. Yeah. Why were they not five years ago, 10 years ago, if these people were worth the millions of dollars they're getting paid, they should have been able to speculate that this would have happened and put the company in, in a good position. Yeah. And there was uh, some, some of the articles have mentioned the selling off of the frequent fly program that they want to do now. Why are they doing it now? Why are they doing it now that it's desperate? You know, yeah. Surely it should have been done yeah. beforehand. Yeah. Um, and once again, it seems that... You, it seems to me, and I know there are a lot of people that will disagree with this because I've had these conversations during the week, that what happens is, is you know, who pays for for the wastage and the crap management at the top? The technicians, the stewards, the caterers, you know, the guy who makes a metal mm. fender for the car, you know, yeah. who goes to work every day and works his tits off and is proud of his job. He's the one that pays because the people up at the top can't run their company That's properly. right. Yep, that's exactly right. We've got to move on, though, because uh, we're running out of time. I've got a, well, it's important to me, but it's probably not important to anybody else. My okay. verge. Yep. My verge. Now, I'm annoyed. Yep. I'm in the city of South Perth, and the only yep. thing I'm allowed to put on my verge is grass or small shrubberies. Now, this irritates me enormously because... It's a complete waste of space. We're talking about something that's maybe, what, 15 metres long by about three metres wide. Now, that yeah. would be the perfect size for me to grow a veggie garden, but I'm not allowed to do it. I'm not allowed to grow a veggie garden because- can people steal your vegetables? No, oh, look, if someone wants a carrot, they can have one. <laughs> But the thing is, I mean, that would be a better use of that particular piece of land. I don't want to keep throwing water on it. And who owns it? I don't own it. The government, the, the local government owns it. So why do I have to look after it? It just, it does my head in. If you're going to ask yeah. me to look after a piece of land, I want to make it productive. Is your, so, I mean, your verge is three metres. How much of that three metres is footpath? A metre? Yeah, well, no. So that would be four metres. So, the, you know, the footpath 1.2 okay. metres so wide. So you've got three, three by 15 metres. Yeah, of grass. So three metres deep of, of nature strip before before the footpath, before the house. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Wow. That's, just, you, you've got big big things there. You know, it's a big verge. Uh, and, and that's why I'm well, saying at the moment we've got grass. Now, we could yeah. replace it with small native plants, but the problem yeah. with that is that that accumulates rubbish and, you know, it just it's not a good look. So okay. I would love to grow a veggie garden. I like a veggie garden, which is an awesome look. Yeah, but you think about it; it makes productive use of the of the ground itself. You're looking after it, 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 it and it, well, it'll require a little bit of water, sure. But I it's think productive. I think part of the problem, maybe from a council's perspective, though, is that they if they start saying yes, you can have a veggie patch on your nature strip, you're going to have potentially the problem of these nature strips uh, being you know, people think it's a great idea start their veggie garden lose interest halfway through stop watering it there's bits of string and posts but and people do that now. everywhere like if you look at the um, verges around here many of them about other people walking past making off with their snow peas oh i don't care about you that know. No, I know you don't care, but people will care. But the other thing is, I'll have no more dogs pooing on my lawn, which drives oh, me up the wall as well. They'll be pooing on your carrots. Mm, yeah, but that's okay. It's fertilizer. Anyway, but yeah, that was a uh, short, I, short one I wanted to bring up. No one's going to do anything about it. I'll have to get used to the fact that um, I'm going to have to have grass on there. I'm also not allowed to put astroturf, and I'm also not allowed to concrete it or put down bauxite. 
Hmm? Why are you not allowed to put AstroTurf? You're just not allowed to. It's got to be grass. So you have more native shrubberies. And if you don't water it and it dies and it goes brown, you can get in trouble for that. Yeah, I yeah, I, that sounds like you've got wankers there at the city. Mind you, to be honest, Jason, the city of South Perth are wankers. Right. I've got some speeding fines from them, and you know, I've never enjoyed uh, having to work in that area. Yeah. Uh, well, certainly or, around Sky Show, the parking fines are ridiculous. Oh well, they're ridiculous anyway. And you know, even if you're there every day working, and uh, and you happen to one day, you know, be an extra five minutes in a spot, you know, and they'll ping you, and then they'll ping you an extra x amount of you know, three times the original thing if you happen to be half an hour late. Just, you know, really, really South Perth. We've got but, two minutes. Have you got another one you want to go? Well, I just maybe uh, just a quick one. I was I was always wondering why people seem, and it was the same with the previous, previous government, it's the same with this government, why people are so outraged by the government. Like what happens is, is the conservative, conservative government gets voted in for whatever reason. And then people pretend or will say, I'm outraged by what this government done. Or this is an outrage. I can't believe they've done I can't believe. What did you think they were going to do? You know, John Howard was the worst prime minister this country had. And we've got someone who is probably worse than him. I wouldn't say um, probably. I'd say definitely. Well, I don't know. I mean, that remains to be, remains to be seen. Well, yeah, well, um, John Howard didn't go and make our biggest militarily strongest neighbour angry with us. Oh, he did a couple of times. Uh, I think East Timor kind of pissed our biggest neighbour off just to, you know, just a little bit. Um, and tensions were reasonably strained at that point. Um, but, you know, people get upset when these governments come in. They're a conservative government. They're going to do conservative things. Uh, the day that government was voted in, I knew what we were in for. Oh, absolutely. You know, but I think I, what it is, Paul, I, I, these days, we, we're in a digital age. So people are either completely outraged or don't care at all. Yeah, well, you're right. Maybe because maybe people feel if they have to bother making, you can't just go, oh, it's a bit crap. Because then people go, why is it a bit crap? And then you have to kind of explain it. So maybe people just take it the next step and they explain something or don't bother saying anything. It's, a, it's an interesting point. I think you've probably crystallised maybe the internet age a little bit there. Mm. You'll have to have these, you know, doggone opinions or just we can't we can't just have a blase, you know, fair, oh, yeah, they're shit. No fence sitting. That's, they, that's boring. They shit? That's, well, you know, you can't even just say they're shit. Oh, they're shit. Why are they shit? Oh, they're just shit. <laughs> well, what I mean, people, well, yeah. well, you should have a reason. It's like, well, I really can't be fucked telling you why I think they're shit, actually. <laughs> you know, we can get into this conversation, I guess. You yeah. might agree. You might disagree. You know, where does it go? So, We're yeah. done. We're done for this week. Ladies and gentlemen, oh. I hope you enjoyed episode 11 of Jordan and Cook. Uh, we've got to go to bed because it's actually starting to get pretty late. Uh, yeah, it's eyed Paul, very so late. I don't think I haven't got my eye on you. Oh, 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 oh. Hilarious. Anyway, hope you enjoyed it. We'll catch you all again next week.